our New Testament passage today is from the book of Acts, uh, verses 26 to 40. And in this, we learn about the journey of Philip, who is one of the first deacons of the church, and his encounter with uh, the Ethiopian eunuch. So hear now the word of God. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Candake, which means queen of, Ethi of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah, the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared as at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. Today we are in our third part of our stewardship sermon series, A Place to Call Home. Throughout this four-week series, we are celebrating... Some of the things about Epworth Church that help people to feel at home in our to feel at home in our faith community as well as challenging others to do even better. Today our focus is on a place to learn. Having been a middle school teacher of social studies and now continuing to teach with youth and young adults in the church, this topic is definitely near and dear to my heart. It is obvious to me from our two Old Testament passages today that learning holds a special place in God's heart as well. In Proverbs, we hear the, the verse say, For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. It's God's intent that we learn. It's God's intent that we receive knowledge. It's God's intent that we be avid learners of what God intends for us to know. In Deuteronomy, uh, it says of God's teachings to recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand, fix them as an emblem on your forehead, and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. It doesn't get much more explicit than that. God's teachings are so important that it's important to share it with your family. It's important to put it everywhere that you see. Imagine standing in the mirror, like before the mirror in the morning, getting ready, and there's God's word right on your forehead because that's where God told you to place it, right? So learning is very important to God. So what are some of the ways that Epworth is a place of learning? Well, we have an active Sunday school and have for several years in which children have been taught the word of God, have been taught about God and how to be good disciples. We've also had adult Sunday school classes that have helped with that as well. We have the Epworth Children's Center, which has been 
blessing the lives of children from our church and from our community. Both of my children grew up in the Children's Center before going off to elementary school, and it prepared them well for that journey. We have the Women's Book Club. We have the Men's Prayer Breakfast. We have many Bible studies for, for youth, for young adults, for other adults um, throughout the church and many different times throughout the year and a variety of different studies as well. We have the Amped Youth Ministry. We have Vacation Bible School. We have our Sunday sermons. And we also have Confirmation Class just to list a few of the ways that Epworth is a place to learn. To make that even more evident, if you have been a teacher, a confirmation mentor, an ex-con, a student in Sunday school, been a part of VBS or anything else, would you please either stand or raise your hand? Look around. So many people have either been a part of the teaching or been affected by the teaching in this church over the years that pretty much everybody can say that they have been a part of this learning. For me, specifically, I find confirmation to be one of the most rewarding things that I do when it comes to actually teaching. Because it's taking someone that the faith has not necessarily been their own and guiding them through a journey to allow their decision of faith to become their own. Each Sunday, we are interviewing members of Epworth Church to share about their experience of Epworth as home. I would like you to hear a little more about confirmation from one of our recently confirmed youth, Lila Martin. So please direct Hi, your attention I'm to Lila the screen. Hi, I'm Lila Martin. I'm 14, and I started going to Epworth last year because I moved from California and like right away basically I started confirmation here and going to AMPT which is our youth group and it's just like from the start everyone was so nice and I started learning so much more in such a different way than I ever had before and it was like really I guess uplifting and eye-opening to see how you can have like a church family and how the, you'll always feel that they're there for you. Well, confirmation, we did it for an entire year and it was like every Sunday morning and we had like different lessons we talked about. So a lot of them was about like God's love and then some of it was about like John Wesley and we even went to like the oldest Methodist church in Baltimore. But I really learned that Jesus is always there and will forgive me. And obviously I already like knew these things but it was really shown to me in a completely new way. I don't know, I like accepted it a different way than I had before. And I felt, by the end, I felt like I actually had a relationship with God. And I thought that I did before, but I don't know if I really had one or had a very like strong one because I found myself praying a lot and it wasn't even like weird or something I was thinking about like it used to be. It just became like a habit. And I began confirmation kind of hoping and thinking that, you know, God was there for me, God always forgave me, but by the end of confirmation, I started actually seeing and truly believing everything that I was learning. And that was a really great experience. <laughs> After a lock-in. So, <laughs> we were here for a lock-in. She got up the next morning. Ed came, camera and everything, and you couldn't tell. She's bubbly. She's wonderful. So, but um, just to expand a little bit on confirmation. Confirmation isn't just something that I do. This is something that the entire church participates in. What makes it amazing and what causes the transformation is a variety of things. We have their Sunday school teachers that help teach them the lessons about, about God, about John Wesley, about the church and everything else. They get those lessons. But they also have a mentor, someone that they've chosen to help guide them through the journey that shares life and shares faith and is a personal part of that journey with them. Not only that, we invite the church three different times. We have three services for confirmation, one in the beginning, one in the middle, one at the end in which we invite the church to participate in confirmation through blessing them and giving them gifts and guiding them through that journey. 
So it becomes an entire church participation in the lives of kids to help them come to know Christ in a new way and to begin that journey. So the transformation that Lila went through over the course of time was not just me, was not just their teachers, was not just her mentor, Christina. Is Christina here? Where's Christina? Oh, she's in nursery. Um, it was all of you. It was your prayers. It was your support. It was everything that you did to be a part of that journey for her and each of the confirmands. It was also, and I'm leaving out a very important part, not just the mentors, but we have ex-cons. This is my loving term for kids that have already been confirmed that come back to be peer mentors for the confirmands. They are Christ confirmed. And they are a huge part of that journey as well. It's their peers helping to guide them in that faith too. But it takes the whole church being a part of that learning experience to really make it something special for each of them. So all of these things that we've shared about how we are a place of learning, they're, they're wonderful ways in which we find opportunities to be a place of learning for others. But is it but it is not enough for us to stop here and pat ourselves on the back. I believe that there is much more that we can do as Epworth Church. As we begin to examine this thought, I would like us to take a look at our New Testament passage for today with Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. First of all, who was Philip? I mentioned that he was one of the first deacons. Uh, when the apostles were together and the, the church was expanding and the people of God were expanding, they, they found that they couldn't handle all the things that were coming at them. So they set aside and they invited seven people to come and be deacons. Stephen was one of them, who's the church's first martyr. Philip was also one of these deacons called to care for the widows and care for the poor. So this is who Philip is coming into this story. This is a servant minister, one of the first deacons. Another thing near and dear to my heart, being a deacon myself. But the really cool thing is we see Philip wandering around. He's, he's going through on his journey, and he hears God call him to go over to the chariot of the eunuch and to listen. He calls Philip to go over and listen. And Philip responds and does that. He listens for what is going on, and he hears the eunuch reading from the scroll of Isaiah and listens to what's going on and recognizes that he needs help in understanding. And he takes the time to uh, bring the story to life for the eunuch so the eunuch actually understands. And we know that this is transformative because shortly thereafter, the eunuch sees water and says, hey... What's keeping me from being baptized right now? The transformation took place because Philip was willing to be the teacher in that moment to help the unit come to really understand who God is and what God was all about. But let's notice something. That whole event took place at the eunuch's chariot. It didn't take place at a church building. It wasn't Philip going up and saying, well, if you really want to know what that's all about, Come to my church on Sunday. Come at 1030 and hear the sermon, and hopefully that's going to teach you something, and hopefully the eunuch would actually respond and come to the church. Philip took the opportunity right then where he was to be the church in the midst of that situation, to be the church for the eunuch. So what are we to learn from this? How does this speak to how we can be a, a place of learning? Notice that the place, as I said, of learning in this passage didn't take place at a church. It took place where Philip and the eunuch happened to be. There is a wonderful old children's song in the church that says, I am the church, you are the church, we are the church together. And then it goes on to say, the church is not a building, the church is not a steeple, the church is not a resting place, the church is the steeple. Ah, very good. While we all know this song, I worry that the message has become a bit trite. We sing, I'm sorry, we sing it, but when it comes right down to it, more often than not, when we speak of church, we are talking about the building that we gather in, right? Recently at a men's breakfast, 
I was reminded of the big three, yeah, three things that Jesus calls us to specifically. To love God, to love our neighbors, and to make disciples. As we discuss these three, we began to break down what each truly means and looks like. The make disciples part was pretty profound for us when we were thinking about it. So we are called to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's huge. Imagine giving everything you got to the love of God. We're called to love our neighbors as ourselves, which means first we have to love ourselves, and then we have to put neighbors, people that we may not even know, at the same level as us. Hard stuff. But then we're also called to make disciples. What does that look like? Is it just inviting someone to the church building? Making a disciple means taking someone under your wing, taking someone by the hand and walking them on the journey of faith, helping them come into the fullness of what it is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Like Philip taking the time to uh, bring the story from Isaiah to life to the point that the eunuch wanted to become a part of the church family, become a part of the body of Christ. I believe that just as in the case of Philip and the eunuch, church can and should happen where each of us are present, where each of us are listening, and where each of us are faithful. The church building is not a place where you bring people to to get fixed or healed or helped. You and I are the church, which means we can help provide the instruction, the care, and the help needed as God's ambassadors wherever we are. It is not just the job of the pastors or the church staff. It is the job of every Christian that has claimed Jesus Christ to be their Lord and Savior. Who you are, both in and outside of the church, matters to God, and it's noticed by others. Is this new information for any of you? Have you not thought about church in this way before? There's three questions that I focus on quite a bit within the youth ministry of the church in helping the youth to come up with answers to these three specific questions. Who am I? Why am I here? And what is my purpose? In helping to develop answers, the who am I is helping them to understand that they are a child of God. Why are they here? Because God's love called them into existence. And what is my purpose? To love God, to love my neighbor, and to make disciples. The more I think about these three questions, the more I realize that all of us individually and collectively as a church family need to examine these questions on a regular basis. Epworth, who are we? Why are we here? What is our purpose? If we don't know the answers to these questions, then we're going to have a difficult time being a place of learning. We need to wrestle with these. Where you go, each of you, Epworth goes. The building is not the only place to learn. Others can and will learn from you. You are not just a learner that comes on Sunday mornings to sit here and learn something. You are a person that learns so that you can go out into the world and teach. So that you can go out into the world and be the presence of God where it is needed. So what must we do? We need to become even better learners. We need to become even more active prayers. We need to draw closer to God that God may be even more real to each and every one of us. Listen for God to call you into opportunities to be the church. Maybe it'll be to teach a Sunday school class. Or maybe it'll be to mentor a confirm man. Maybe you'll be asked to lead a Bible study. Maybe it's inviting others at your office to a time of prayer to begin the work day. When I taught in Baltimore City, a good friend of mine, Mark, who some of you know, um, he would invite me to his office every morning for a cup of tea and a time of prayer before we went into teaching the day. And with how difficult that school was, I really think that time helped me to get through some of the most difficult days. Imagine what that might look like 
at your place of work. Now, it would require you coming out and letting people know, hey, I'm a Christian and prayer is important to me. Maybe it's buying a meal for the person behind you in the drive through line. Maybe it's noticing someone in need <clears throat> and mobilizing Christ's body to respond. <clears throat> we were very blessed as a community last, uh, last December to have this happen. It was coming close to Christmas, and Anita happened to be out shopping, <clears throat> and she ran into a lady in a parking lot and got to talking to her, and the lady asked her, does your church sponsor people for Christmas? And literally, it was only maybe two or three weeks before Christmas. We found out about this, and Anita called me and said, is this something we can do? And I came back to the church, and I mentioned it to all of you, and you guys blessed this family and two other families just before Christmas with presents, with food, with uh, John McGuckin dressing up as Santa Claus and other people coming together to actually create the sleigh of pickup trucks that went to these people's homes and brought Christmas and blessing and love to these families. But it took Anita in a parking lot being willing to listen to and talk to and respond to the needs of a person that she met where she was. It's pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. Maybe it's also taking someone under your wing and sharing God's love, teachings, and wisdom with them. Some of you know my son, Nathan, and he's been singing in the choir and playing bells uh, at different times, and he's loved doing that. Uh, but one of the reasons he's continued to do that is because people in the choir, especially some of the gentlemen up there, took him under, his, under their wing and encouraged him to do so. And it gave him the confidence and helped him to feel comfortable to do that. But it took people stepping out of themselves a little bit to say, hey, I can be an encouragement to this young man. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. These are just some of the ways that you can be a teacher, that you can be mobilized to be the church where you are, both in our building and outside of our building. Remember also that it's important to begin some of this at home. There's a passage from Joshua that I take very seriously that says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. One of the things I'm doing specifically in the next couple weeks is I'm... I'm going to be helping to lead a coming of age celebration for my son Nathan along with some faithful men that are coming together with me to do this to be able to be a blessing to him as he journeys into manhood to see that he's not alone in that journey and that he will be a part of uh, something even bigger as a father I want to instill faith as one of the cornerstone qualities of each of my children and I do not want them to think that faith and church is just something that we do for an hour on Sunday mornings. I want them to realize that they are the church wherever they are. That they are the church wherever they are, just as each of us are. So church, you are a place of learning. God desires to use you as his witnesses to share his teachings wisdom, and love. Where you go, Epworth goes. One last story, and it just came up this weekend, and then we'll close. We had a lock-in <clears throat> Friday night into, into Saturday, and I did an object lesson in which she was using a couple bottles of soda and talking about how we deal with our emotions, how we deal with uh, our feelings and everything else how we do that, and when things frustrate us, and talking about, you know, their school and tests and stresses, and every time I talked about something, I shook up the bottle and shook it up and got it really going because, you know, you get frustrated, you get aggravated, you go inside, you shake that bottle, it's your emotions and everything else, but then the reminder comes that God wants us to pour our lives into other people, so we open the bottle. 
And you can imagine what happened to all the soda. It just all came out of the bottle. There wasn't much left to put into the cups that represented other people that we could pour our lives into. So I picked up the other bottle, and I said, what if we did this? And every time we got into a stressful situation, we got on our knees and prayed. We called a friend to come and be there for us to, to help us with it. We had other people pray for us and be with us in the midst of the struggles that we're going through. And in the end, we could open the bottle. It didn't pour out all over the place. We could pour our lives into others. Now, it was a neat lesson, but the coolest part of that was the parents of one of the young ladies came up to me, one of the young ladies that was on the, in the lock-in. She went home recreated that skit to show to her sister and filmed it and taught the entire thing to her family because it profoundly impacted her. That's what happens when we teach. We teach others, they become witnesses, they take that story and they go forth and they teach other people and we become the church wherever we are. So Epworth, where will you begin to be the church of Epworth today? Amen. Would you please join me?